Good morning, everyone. My name is Tess, and uh, most privileged to be here today to share some thoughts in this time of communion. And thanks for the warm welcome, Roger. Thank you. Have you been complaining a lot lately about your internet provider, especially after the storm recently? It sometimes is too slow or we sometimes do not have any connection at all. It gets frustrating, isn't it? Especially now that we need it because most of our transactions are done online. Meetings are virtual, therefore we need online connection. And working from home can only be made possible when we are online. We need that right connection badly. We need the right partnership with our service provider. But there is a more significant connection that we need in life. 1 John 1.3 says that which, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, there will be no true fellowship. When we have the right connection with God, we have the right relationship with God. When we have a broken relationship with God, we have a broken connection with God. Life is designed for companionship, not isolation. For intimacy, not loneliness. Let us not isolate ourselves and try to do it alone. Let's not lose our connection with one another. But most of all, let us not lose our connection with God. He always listens. God knows what's on our mind and our heart, but still He wants to listen from us. He wants to hear from us. God knows we need Him every day. Connecting with others will take effort and strength that is why we need to be constantly connected to Him, to the ultimate source of life, who is God alone. When we connect with God, we will never experience an offline connection because He is online 24-7. Involving God in everything we do is simply making God present in every aspect of our life, in our personal life, in our day-to-day decision-making, work, hobbies, goals, and thoughts, aspirations. Making God present in our life is being able to live our life without disconnect, disconnecting ourselves from God. We shouldn't only remain connected to God when we're in church, when we read the Bible, praying, or doing godly things. Our connection with God should transcend or go beyond the limits of all this. It is important to connect with God and have a relationship with Him because when we're with Him, we're never alone. This time of communion is a reminder of our ongoing relationship and connection with Him, remembering what Jesus had, do had done on the cross for us. The bread and grape juice are tangible, physical reminders of Christ's love for us every time we eat and drink. It is a reminder of the sacrifice of Christ, what He had done for us on the cross. Luke 22, 19 to 20 says, And He took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you. That is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This time of communion is that time when we can corporately express our love for Him, thanking Him for what He has done, for what He is doing, and for what He is about to do in each and every one of us. As we examine ourselves, some of us may feel unworthy to come to Him, thinking that we are not good enough, that we are constantly failing in our walk with God, and that we have blown it yet again. Friends, I want to encourage us all that this is the very reason Christ died for each and every one of us. And that is why He came for us. 
Today, let's partake these elements of His broken body and shed blood and use this time to reflect on the sacrifices that He had gone through for us to have life and have it more abundantly. Can I please uh, request everyone to be upstanding? Thank you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your lavish love for us, for how you have shown your love for us, that you have sacrificed yourself, your body to be pulped on the cross for us, and for your blood to be shed for us sinners. We thank you for this time when we can reflect on your goodness, your mercy, and your grace towards us. Lord, we want to be connected to you. We want to have that authentic, genuine relationship with you, and we can just freely come into the throne room of grace and say, Lord, here we are. Be with us. Use us. We thank you for this time of communion, Lord, when we can just remember all the benefits of Calvary. Lord, as we partake of this, Lord, may we always recall your goodness, your mercy, and your grace upon us. Thank you for everything that you have done. We give you all glory, honor, power, and praise that you alone deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us eat and drink. Well, good morning, and thank you for uh, inviting us to be part of your morning service. And we're always uh, um, con- considered it, uh, as a big privilege for Tess and myself to be here to join you. Um, and I'm al- always looking forward for a time when we can just spend our time together, um, be part of your wonderful worship service. My name is Greg, and um, I'm part of the part of our NLCC. You hardly see me, but we're, we're a family. <laughs> um, the title of my message today is The Prodigal Father and the Two Sons. Uh, it is a combination of two messages that I've shared recently, but I'd like to glean all the, the bits and pieces and share this, you, share this uh, today, this morning. Um, at, uh, I'm aiming to finish within 30 or 35 minutes, but it's a combination of two messages. So please do bear with me as I share the, the Word of God. And our text for today is Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 31. And Joy will uh, have the privilege of sharing or reading this story about the, lost, the parable of the lost son. Joy, thank you. So Luke 15, 13 to 31, it says, A few days later, this young, younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he, was, there he wasted all his money, living, um, money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even hired servants have, have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will come home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his, to his father. And while, he was, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he, said, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and to you. I no longer were worthy of being called your son. But his father said, but his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. 
for his for this son of mine has come for, sorry for his son for this son of mine was dead and now he is returned to life he was lost but now he is found so the party began while the older son was in the fields working when he returned home he heard music and dancing in the house and he and he asked one of the servants what's going on your brother has come back he was told he was told and your father has killed the fattened calf we are celebrating because he has returned safe the, the the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in his father came out and begged him but he replied all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you've told me. And in all the time, you never, gave, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back for, how do you say that? Squattering? Yeah, squattering. <laughs> uh, your money on uh, prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by my side, and everything I have is yours. What a, an amazing story. And uh, there's so many things, truths that we can glean from the, uh, the story. And, you know, knowing the truth is the ultimate goal in life and our mission our, our, our aim today is to get as much as possible truths coming from the story. Uh, the, the biggest question, I think, is how much do we know God as our Father? How much do we know God as our Father? There's a funny story between these three boys, and they're boasting and talking about how good their father, father was. And um, the first one said, my dad's so fast. He can shoot an arrow and run and catch it before it hits a target. Well, the second one said, well, my dad works on a high-rise buildings. He, he, he was so fast, he, he can drop a brick from the 10th story and run down and catch it before it hits the ground. Well, the thor third boy said, well, my dad works for the city council. He's so fast that he finishes work at 4 p.m., but gets home by 2.30. <laughs> They're bragging about their dads. Uh, but my question to, to us today is, how much do we really know our father? You know, in an article entitled Fatherless America, David Blankenhorn calls the crisis of fatherlessness the most destructive trend of our generation. It can be not having a father or maybe not knowing the father. And it was confirmed by another Brit, um, a recent British report from the University of Birmingham. Um, he, she actually confirmed, he confirmed that, um, uh, that, um, that article. Um, and he wrote a book, that, um, Dad and Me, an article, Dad and Me, confirms that that was right and concluding that the, the need of a father is on an epidemic scale. You know, m my dad passed away when I, was, uh, when I was 15, and I, as a son, did not have a good kind of recollection of, of my father, although he, he was a typical father, hardworking, a good provider, but I didn't have a recollection of spending good quality time with him. But regardless of our past experiences in life with our earthly fathers, we have available to us a relationship with our heavenly father, the God, the creator of heavens and the earth. And friends, as children of God, not knowing our father will also have a, an ad adverse effect in our spiritual growth. And the more we spend time with the father, the, the deeper our relationship would be. And the deeper our relationship with the Father, the more we will know the truth about the Father and the more we can know Him. And, and it's more liberating to really have that intimacy and understanding who our Father is. That's why in John 8, 32, it says, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. 
So it empowers us to live a life that is free from fear and doubt, and it allows us to live with purpose. You know, to be, to be the children of Bill Gates, and, and it's quite amazing. You know who's your, who's your dad, one of the billionaires. And, and you know the more you are connected to your dad, the more it brings so much peace and comfort and joy to you because you know who is your father. You know, um, in that story that we've, that Joy just read, you know, the biggest question is, who is the real prodigal in the story? Although, uh, when you read that, and uh, sometimes they put a title, the prodigal son. But the question is, who is the real prodigal in the story? The son or the father? You see, over the years, the word prodigal has lost its true meaning. Because of what we call the semantic shift or semantic change, the evolution of the usage of the word, the modern meaning has radically changed and has become different from the original usage. And, you know, semantics is actually a study of meaning in word. Just for example, before 10, 20 years ago, the word wicked means evil. But because of that semantic shift, you hear that with the young guys, wow, that's wicked. That means you say, that's too good, that's awesome. And the word awful, literally full of awe. And it means inspiring, wonder, or impressive. But because of that semantic change, the contemporary usage of the word awful now means extremely bad. In the case of the parable of the lost son, due to the semantic change, you know, the modern meaning of the word prodigal can mean now irresponsible, wasteful, reckless, wild, and rebellious. But the word prodigal, the, the, the original rendering of the word prodigal, it actually it came from a Latin word prodigus, which means extravagant, lavishly, extremely generous that was the real mean that's a real meaning of the word prodigus or prodigal so understanding the true meaning of the word prodigal we know that it is not the son but it's the father who expressed extravagance and extreme generosity to his son but how did the father respond to those to his two sons but before we answer that i just would like um, talk about the two sons, if it's, if it's okay with you. As we carefully read the story, we will find that both sons did not know who their father was. Both sons were lost. Check their attitudes to their father. Both sons were lost, not fully understanding that they were in that most privileged position as sons, as children of that prodigal, that extravagant father. They both failed to realize their position as sons and therefore acted differently. The sons failed to recognize their fa father, the heart of the father, the nature and character of the father. You know, the younger son misused and abused the resources and the privilege of being a son. He became unrighteous by leaving his father, his brother, living recklessly. Well, the older son did not utilize the resources and the privilege of being a son, not realizing that everything that the father owned was his. He became so self-righteous that he could not accept his wayward brother and was so upset with his father because of the way his father received the younger brother. Not fully understanding who their father was, the brothers both created a different attitude, perspective towards each other and towards their father. Friends, the, that is the missing piece of this story. 
And I'd like you to go back to that story again, and you will, the Lord might reveal something else to you. They both missed the point of understanding the greatest privilege of being called sons of the prodigal father. If they only knew that their father was an extravagant, lavishly, and extremely generous father, they would have acted differently. If they only knew that. You know, both sons, they both committed sin. The younger brother committed the sin of commission. Lived a sinful, irresponsible, and wasteful life. An action that he proactively had done. The older brother committed the sin of omission. For not doing something that was right. For failing to take an action that he ought to have done. He was the son. He was the eldest son. But he did not do anything about his father's resources. You know, if you read the parables in the Bible, in the gospel, it talks about responsible stewardship. You and I. God has given us something. We're a lot better off than those people living overseas and God is expecting us to be responsible stewards of all the blessings that we have what is remarkable and unveiling in this story was what the father said to the oldest son in verse 31 it says my son you're always with me and everything I have is yours Think about that. Everything that the father owned is yours. You know, the younger son had a different outlook towards his father and therefore abused and misused his father for his own lastful desires. You know, the younger son saw himself as a master and wanted his father to serve him. Think about those people who have an attitude of entitlement. They deserve this. We deserve this. Verse 12 in Luke chapter 15, it says, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of my estate. So he divided his property between them and he gave it to them. That's how generous the father was in this story. His motive in life is all about comfort and convenience. I've got a rich father. I deserve this. I'm, you know. Well, the older son also had a different view of his father. The older son saw his father as a master and he wanted to serve him. In verse 29, it says, this was the, 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 the eldest, older son speaking. He said, Luke, All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Wow. I love that. You know, the oldest son did nothing but to serve in order to please the father. And his motive in life is all about commitment and sacrifice. Two sons, two different perspectives. He lost sight of himself and had been blinded by his own desire to serve, not realizing that he was already pleasing to the Father, being a son. I remember Jesus, when he was about to start his ministry, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and the Holy Spirit came upon him. And uh, they've heard a voice saying, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus was about to start his ministry. He hasn't done anything yet. And yet, because of the fact that Jesus was the son of the living God, he was so pleased, so pleasing to the Father. He failed to recognize that he was a son, not a servant. He failed to realize his position as a son and lived like one 
of the servants. You know, my suspicion with the older, old, older son is that he spent most of his growing up years not in the presence of the father, but with the servants. The reason he developed that, that, that servant mentality. It's all about serve, 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 serve. And not enjoying that wonderful privilege. He was in the house, but not at home. He was a son, but lived his life like a servant. One father, two sons, two different beliefs, two different theologies. You know, as believers, we have the, the tendency, the propensity to create our own theology about God, our Father, and fall in one of these two beliefs or theologies. The younger son theology, focusing on comfort and convenience, and the older son theology, focusing on commitment and sacrifice. You know, theology is the study of God. It, it actually comes from two Greek words, theo and logos. Theo means God, logos means word. It's that, that as we study the word of God, we will understand God and our relationship to him as our father. So theology was de developed to help Christians rethink and rediscover this relationship, this wonderful relationship we have with the father. You know, I bought a book many years ago, uh, and the title of the book is Cat and Dog Theology. Have you read that, that book? Is there anyone? Cat and Dog Theology. You know, a cat and a dog have different views of their master. Cats tend to consider themselves the center of the universe, and everyone else responding to their needs and desires. And on the other hand, dogs live to serve and please their masters. Both cats and dogs want obedience in their lives, but in different ways. Dogs want to obey their masters. Cats want their masters to obey them. Dogs say to their masters, you feed me, you pet me, you shelter me. Oh, you love me. You must be God. Well, cats say, you feed me, you pet me, you shelter me, you love me. <laughs> I must be God. <laughs> Friends, in many ways, this analogy characterizes practical Christian theology today. And as per, per that cat theology, you know, there are some who would think, believers would think that Jesus came to make their lives safe and easy and comfortable. They would also think that Jesus left the Father's glory for me. He suffered and died on the cross for me. He's gone back to heaven to build a mansion for me. He's up there interceding for me and is coming back for me. Wow, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> You know, on the other hand, people who have the dog theology thinks this way. I need to live for his glory. And if need be, suffer and die for him. He's gone back to heaven to build, to build a mansion for me. So I have, build, I have to build his kingdom while I'm here on earth. I really have to pray hard because he's there interceding for me. Therefore, I will pray. I need to pray hard and pray more. And he's coming back soon, so I need to keep serving and serving him and ready for his return. You know, most Christians we meet fall under one of these two categories. <laughs> Commitment and sacrifice precede comfort and convenience. Christian life is not just comfort and convenience. Christian life is not just commitment and sacrifice. You know, the ironic thing about life is that you need commitment and sacrifice before you experience comfort and convenience. And it applies to any part and aspect of life in business and anything else. You know, I've heard this number one tennis player, she was once asked about the key 
uh, for her to, to, to maintain the, um, you know, being number one. And she said, I have two keys. Commitment and sacrifice. You know, both theology have merits. And I also agree with the dog theology, but the only problem, problem is if we will be doing it from a position of being a servant and not from a position of being a son or daughter of the living God, we will be missing the point. And we will end up like the self-righteous older son of the prodigal father. Let me read to you Luke 15, 28, 29, and verse 31. It says, The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, at all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. I love what the father said. My son, my son. The father said, You're always with me. And everything I have is yours. Wow. Yes, he was in the house, but he was not home. Friends, our love, our commitment, our obedience to God must not come from a position of being a servant, but from a position of understanding that we are sons and daughters of the living God. Friends, always remember that. Write that in your Bible. Scribble that at the very tablet of your heart and remind yourself every morning you wake up, every time you go to bed, I'm a son of God and my father is the most extravagant, generous father. I tell you, you can sleep well. <laughs> You will wake up looking for, for a wonderful day. And because we have that relationship with God, knowing Him to be our Father and we His children, this will empower us to love Him more and know Him more and serve Him more. But the truth of the matter is not everyone is a child of God. I've heard a lot of people saying that we are all children of God. That's not true. Not everyone is a child of God. First and foremost, we need to become a child of God. I came from a very religious background and I thought we're doing okay. Then someone shared to me the gospel that I found out that, oops, I thought, I, I, thought I'm, I was kind of going to heaven, but I was actually heading towards a, in a different, different, um, um, different place. The truth of the matter is not every human being is a child of God. It is right to say that we are all created beings of God, but we are not all children of God. The Bible is so clear and stated clearly the requisite, the requirement for us to become a child of God. Again, I came from a very um, religious background. Every single day, every 6, 6 p.m. with my siblings, we would come together and pray. 5 a.m. first mass, we will be together with my mom, mom and dad. We will be there. I thought I was doing, we were doing okay. The Bible has clearly stated the requisite to become a child of God. John chapter 1 verse 11 to 12, it says, He came to his own, but his own received him not. But to those who will receive him, he will give them the right. In other translation, it says, He will give them the power or He will give them the authority to become a child of God. Joe Biden, the president of America, has got four kids. They can go in and out in the White House. Security guard, they don't even care. Why? Because they know. They know that they are Joe Biden's kids. I'll give... I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a money to buy an airfare and do the same thing. I don't think you can do that. Why? Because you're not re related at all to John, to, to Biden. And that's the power of being a child of God. You know, the big difference between you and those people outside 
is that you have the touch of the divine. Your life is hidden in Christ, is what the Bible says. What I mean is that you are a child of God. You are a child of the living God. And being a child of God is not the end, but the beginning of this ongoing, thriving love relationship as his children in him as our father. And this has to continue on. You're not coming from the point of being a servant. You're coming from a point that you have all the right, the power, the authority, because you are a child of God. Each day we need to grow in that knowledge and understanding about who our father really is. What kind of father he is. And that's an ongoing pursuit of our life as believer. To clearly understand and know more and have a deeper relationship about the father. And it, that is inexhaustible. By the time you know something about the father, there's another one that you need to know about the father. So amazing. You know, it's not about just knowing, knowing about Him. It's actually knowing Him. You know, Roger, we know about Roger. He's a good man. He's faithful. But that's all we know about Roger. We know about him. But there's one person here who knows Roger really well. One sitting next to, <laughs> to him. Why? Because they made a commitment and sacrifice for that relationship. They have that personal, intimate, ongoing relationship until death do us part. That's, that's a commitment. That, that's the kind of personal relationship that we need to have with God our Father. So how did the father respond to his sons? Firstly, how did the prodigal father respond to the youngest son? You know, though undeserving, I'm talking about the, the, the youngest son, and yet he gave to him his cut. When he asked for um, his inheritance, he just, there's no but or ifs. He just divided a lot and gave everything to him. You know, his love for his son was never ending and has not changed a bit, although he knew that it may be the last time he would see his son. And from the time his son left, he intensified his prayer. And you know, what, what, what is interesting is that possibly each day he would sit near the window and from sunrise to sunset and look from afar, hoping that it would be the day that he would return. But if didn't happen that day, he would say, maybe tomorrow. You know, he never lost hope. What an amazing father he was. He never lost hope, believing that as the days go by, he was getting closer and closer to the day of seeing his son again. You know, the most anticipated day came. While, there, while the son was still a great way off, the father saw his son that was lost. It says, it says here, and the father, father saw him and had compassion on his son. You know, literally the meaning of the word compassion is to suffer together. It was not only his son who was suffering while the son was away. His father suffered with him. He was always on his mind. The father was also carrying the pain. And the burden the son was carrying. Out of his pure love and extravagant, generous heart. When he came and when he come, came close to his son, he asked the stewards to bring the best robe. The best robe for his son. And it actually symbolizes authority being a son. He actually put a ring on his finger. It symbolizes pure and endless love to his son. A son that was on his, on his feet, a symbol that, is, that he is clean, a gesture that his sins were forgiven. What an amazing father he was. But how did the prodigal father respond to his older son? 
He came to his son and pleaded with him. He did not use his authority as a father, but he did not lord over him, but pleaded with him. He was a father. He could do whatever he wanted to do. But what is remarkable, again, in unveiling this story, was what he said to the eldest son. Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Friends, the father did all this because that was the kind of father he was. He was a prodigal father, an extravagant, lavishly, and extremely generous father. It was his nature to be generous, to give extravagantly and lavishly. It was his nature to love and to do otherwise will go against his nature. 1 John 4, 8, it says, God is love. Everything that God will say or do is within the limits and boundaries of God's pure, generous, and extravagant love. Friends, that is a good reason for us to trust Him and give our everything to Him because His intention to you is always pure. You know, this story is an allusion of God's big heart to us, not His servants, to us, His children. How does God our Father express His generosity and extravagant love to us, to you and me, His children? You know, He shows His extravagant love to us, number one, by creating a wonderful and grand plan in your life. You know, a lot of people these days, they don't really know the plan of God in their lives. And because of not knowing the plan of God in their lives, they're, you know, they, they're cutting short and they shortchange themselves by, by not pursuing the plan and purpose of God. You know, God's plan in our life is far bigger and greater than ours. God the Father knows the plans He has for us. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Before you saw the light of the day, I had holy plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, 11, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. To give you hope and to give you future. Friends, the word plan in that verse is a technical word used by the engineers. It is, it is the basis, an intention, it is a decision about what one is about to do. Thinking about God, the Father. It is the detailed diagram, drawing, showing the layout and the whole building or a project. And by looking on the plan, by reading the Bible, we can know exactly the expected outcome. You know, our destiny is chosen by God, but its fulfillment is decided by us. The way we live our life. God is looking at us and He knows exactly our finished product. Because God is eternal. There is no past, present, future in God. This is something that our mind cannot comprehend. Our mind is so limited. How can we understand eternity? He is an eternal God. And God has worked out His plan for you and me. And it would be unwise for you. It would be unwise for you and me to create a different plan. Because, because God's plan in our life is always far bigger and greater than ours. Second one, by giving us everything we need. Ephesians 1, 17 to 19, it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance to you and me. 2 Peter 
chapter 1, verse 3, in Amplified Translation, it says, For His divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness. Through His divine power, God has given us everything, all things we need pertaining to this life and godliness. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, And you have been made complete in Christ who is the head of all rule and authority. The third one, how did God uh, show His generosity to us? By giving us His best. You don't deserve second best. Because He is your generous Father, extravagant Father. He would always think something like the best for you. And this is what He did. He gave us the best. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. 32, it says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God the Father has given you his son, the very best. Do you think anyone, can you think of something or someone better than Jesus? He's given us the best. And friends, he's longing for us to come back to our senses like that uh, lost son and return to him not as a, our master, but as our father. And experience his love, his compassion, his generosity, and, and his grace. Ephesians 1.5, it says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. You know Jesus is our perfect example. Jesus knew who his father was. John chapter 10 verse 15 it says, even as the father knows me and I know the father. Wow. You know, Jesus at the age of 12, 12 years old, at the age of 12, knew that God was his father. Luke chapter 2 verse 49, when Mary and, and, and the father, his, his father was looking for, they were looking for him. Jesus said to them, why? Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Luke chapter 3 verse 22, when Jesus was baptized, the voice from heaven came and they heard a voice from heaven saying, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Jesus came and introduced us to God, not as Yahweh, but as our Father. You will read, read, the, read the gospel you will always find Jesus is directing us not to the master, but to the Father. In his prayer, the disciples asked, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray in this manner, our Father. You know, when Jesus was tempted, after that 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, he was tempted and the temptation, you, 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 you read that and you will find the temptation of the, de of the devil, Satan himself. If you are the son of God. If you are the son of God, make this stone bread. If you are the son of God. We need to understand that. You know, the heaven is at stake. Because there will be a father full of servants, but no sons and daughters. His intention, God's, God, God's intention is to populate heaven with sons and daughters. And G understanding Jesus' heart and intention, Jesus wants a father and a son relationship and not a master and a servant relationship. The second thing, that you will find with Jesus, him as our example. Jesus saw him as a father, not as a master. 
throughout the gospel, you will find he will always, he would always call him Father. Jesus followed and obeyed the Father from the position of being a son, not from a position of being a servant. And do you know him declaring that God was his father? It actually cost him his life. In John chapter 5 verse 8 it says, This was why the Jews were seeking the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. Making himself equal with God. Because when you become a child of God, you're that close. You are, you deserve all that he's got. Third one, Jesus loved the Father, that he followed him even to the point of death. Jesus knew the Father so well that he was able to live in total humility till death. Jesus was so secure with his Father, Father's presence, knowing that his Father was always with him and for him. The Father and Son had a relationship characterized by love for each other. So whatever Jesus did from beginning to the end, you know, even at the point of death, he was nailed on the cross, about to die. And this is what he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. See that intimacy of the Father and the Son. You know, Jesus says in John, John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in His love. And as, I, as we draw to a close, I just would like to ask the, the musicians to come. In John 15, 9, it says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Friends, Jesus is encouraging us to rediscover our relationship with the Father. Friends, we are invited to have a personal intimate, ongoing, growing, thriving relationship with the Father. We need to live our life not as servants, but as God's children. Let us enjoy the benefits of being a child of God. Remember, commitment and sacrifice is our response because, of, because He is our Father, our prodigal Father, who is extravagant and extremely generous Father. Remember that our devotion, our service is not from the position of being a servant, but from a position of being a son, a daughter of the living God. Father, may, may you help us. Speak to us and encourage us. I pray that the words that we've shared this morning, Lord God, Holy Spirit, that you will take those words and personalize those words and allow those words to speak into our hearts. Lord, in our weaknesses, let, let it be our strength. Lord, when there is darkness, let there be a light for us. And let us, Lord God, enjoy this wonderful benefit of being your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way bigger, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working
Thank you. 